Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to this episode of Be Real. I got my buddy from the project here. I know, I know, I got a lot of buddies from the project. Why? Because they're badass human beings that love to pour back into other people. And I just, if more people poured back into more people, we wouldn't have the world we live in. We would have a world where everybody was more loving. Even if we have differences of opinions, we would love each other. Um, I met Matt back in 20, in Jennifer, Mark, August or something of 2019. Um, when I was looking at all the can uh, at, at joining the project, I remember looking at the gentleman there and Matt's got a softer demeanor, but that doesn't mean that he's not a hundred percent heart. He, he listens a lot and then he gives very thoughtful answers. And I think that's because of the lifestyle that he had growing up. Uh, I'm not going to get into your personal story, Matt. I'm going to let you share your story. I'm just going to share a little bit about why I wanted you on the on the podcast because it is called Be Real. Um, you're always real with people. You always give amazing feedback. Um, for me personally, I felt that you were one of the people that during the project, when you said something, you remind me of my uncle that doesn't talk a lot. But when he says something, it's like spot on because you've been thinking about it. You've been paying attention. You've been listening. And you always had spot on feedback. And I know you've had some experiences owning your own business. I know you now work over at Fit Body Bootcamp. You also had experience in the FBI and the SWAT. Um, and you, you just bring a level of integrity that I think is lacking in the world. And it just, it, 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 it excites me when I see you because I, you just have that warm, fuzzy feeling. Like when I saw you in Vegas um, after the project with your wife and family, and I'm like, you know, you just, you just make people feel safe. And maybe that's because of your background in law enforcement, but you make people feel safe to be themselves and to be around you. And that's what this is about. You know, that's what the world is about is to be yourself and stop hiding behind the mask and now really the mask, um, but to just be you. So I wanted to give you the microphone, brother, so that you could share your story and tell people who Mr. Snyder is. Welcome to the stage, bro. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Very kind of you and kind uh, words. That's a, a great uh, introduction. Appreciate it, bud. I, I can't make stuff up. It's just you know, I don't, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm not Tom Bailu that writes out and reads your whole bio and your whole life. I just, you know, with people I know about, I can speak just from the heart because that, that's what it's about, right? It's just speaking from the heart. So tell me, start wherever you want, man. I mean, tell me why you got into the project or how, how your life got you to where you're at today, because I think the past paints the present. Yeah, it absolutely does. And um, we're all on a journey, right? I mean, I think we we all recognize that our time on this revolving rock in the middle of outer space um, is very is very finite. And, you know, when you really look at at history and the, the amount of, of millions of years life has been on it, uh, life is just a vapor. And so I um, that's that's a part of how I, I often think and and um, allow myself to be guided with that because what we do on this world uh, and what we do with the people that are that are you know in it with us uh, is very meaningful but we don't have a lot of time to do it so you know as far as background goes and in history um, you know I had a, a relatively interesting childhood yeah um, we all are products of our environment and you know when we are young when we were when we were you know, kids in our adolescence um, the environmental exposure that we are subjected to that we don't have a choice in uh, it's it it makes us who we are in a lot of ways um, as we get older and so for me and myself I, I had an extremely loving uh, caring mother that uh, would do anything for her five kids um, but she had really bad choice in men and um, and so I grew up with a just a revolving door of men and quote unquote father figures uh, throughout uh, most of my life and uh, you know just to 
to emphasize what that might look like for your listeners, um, you know, she's currently on her ninth divorce. And so if you think about the number of men that she didn't marry uh, that were just boyfriends, uh, and then you add that into the number of men that she did marry and then subsequently divorced, um, that's a wow. lot of that's a lot of guys. Yeah. Dude, so I that's I, a I crazy amount of yeah. Yeah. I haven't met wow. anybody yet who can who can uh who can beat that stat. And so, but, you know, again, it, my mom, um, you know, just adored us. It wasn't, she just had bad choice in, in, in men and she can look back now and she can understand um, the impact that that had. And, sure. and, um, but it, it also offers a, a lot in, um, in my ability to be adaptable and, uh, you know, things that are applied to the project. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but, um, you know, a little bit of time in California when I was about 14 years old, moved up to Idaho. Um, I went to high school there, uh, junior high and high school there. When I graduated, um, I I found myself uh, not really sure what it was I wanted to do next, but I did have a friend who was a, who was a police officer at that time that took me out for a ride along and, um, and it was then when I realized what it was that law enforcement was really doing within the community and the role they played. And, and, um, I wasn't one of those kids that ever really grew up wanting to be a police officer. I, I, um, I think I moved around too much. I think I was always on the go to the point to where, um, I never had that kind of stability to where I could really think about that. Um, but well, before I, we get into the law enforcement, I, yeah. I want to unpack a little bit of your childhood. Yeah, um, I, I think you glazed over that a lot, you know, um, and it, you know, that's why when I and, and the, when I got to know you and we we shared stories at the project. It was about it, it, you can tell why your heart is so big. And I when I see you with your family and I see the way what kind of man you are, it, it, it just is like, OK, that makes a lot of sense why you're so present. And I think your presence is the biggest present of all, because maybe as a child, you didn't have that father figure. So you're making up for it, right? You know, air quotes, making up for it, but you're, you're just actually being the person who maybe you wanted to have in your life as a kid. And so now you're sharing that with the other people in your life and with the other men that you get to impact and your employees that look up to you as, as a leader. But you know, going through the, you know, your mom's on her, you know, and it, it sucks that she has to suffer so much herself, right? Mm-hmm. Because going through this is not easy for her. And it sucks as a child to see your mom suffer because as a boy and as a man, we're built to be natural protectors and to see mama bear suffering and in pain. It's like, especially when you don't really know, you're like, wait, what's going on? So, go back to when you're nine, 10, five, six, four, and, and the doors, you know, like you said, it's opening and closing with new male figures coming and going. I mean, how does that, if I can't, I don't know what it's like. I grew up in a household where my parents are still married. Sometimes I thought they, they shouldn't be, but they still are something like 43 years. Oh, today's actually their anniversary. Um, So it's like 44 years marriage. So they, always been there. And I think a lot of people don't know what it's like to have, I mean, I divorce in one other marriage, maybe, but you know, two is kind of like, whoa, five or six is like, damn, that's nuts. 10 is or nine. It's, it's another world, man. Yeah. 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 You know, I, as a kid, you don't really know what's, what's quote unquote normal versus abnormal, right? You just know yeah. your, your world sure. and, and your world is, is normal to you um and uh, there was a point where i don't even know how old i was but you know i loved playing sports as a kid and and um you know there was there was a some point where i had a variety of trophies on my wall and i you know i had to have been getting closer to probably 11 or so um and those trophies i remember i had a friend over and they're looking at them and you know amongst the trophies i had i had trophies with three different last names on them and you know again at that point i i didn't know that that wasn't or i didn't know that right. other households didn't have other circumstances happening like like mine and so 
it was, but it was at that moment when they're like, Hey, what's going on with this? I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, this is, this is what's been going on. And um, they wouldn't necessarily, I only had one of the, of the father figures um, actually adopt me and, and the siblings. And we took his last name formally and legally, but um, for whatever reason throughout the process, like when my mom would get married, our last names would just kind of change. Um, so I had a variety of last names, um, which did make later on in life going into law enforcement interesting because the background <laughs> check, they had to uh, kind of sort through that whole thing. But um, it was it was that time that I realized that, you know, my circumstance wasn't normal. And um, well, at least it, at least it wasn't normal in, in the in the how it's defined amongst other other families and households, but it was tough to see my mom, you know, get involved with these these guys and um, not have the circumstances work out because that that um, protector side, you know, I was I was the second oldest uh, in the family, but there's a six year gap between myself and my older brother. And so there was, you know, by the time I was really kind of understanding this, my brother was becoming an adult and he was out of the house. And so I was taking on that, that um, kind of the head of the house role. Right. And so it was, it was a lot to process through. It was a lot to, to try to understand. Um, but, you know, it, I, I'm, I've learned a, a lot about myself and relationships as a result, you know, as far as, as far as like myself goes, I'm, I'll be married for 15 years um, this coming June. Oh, well, I said 15 years, not, I was, um, yeah, 15 years, dang. 15 years this June. Dang, like good or day. You know what? We're not going to let her hear that part. We're going to have to. <laughs> no, it's just how fast time flies, man. Yeah, it's just, it's just it's crazy. You, time, yeah, t- how fast it flies. But uh, 15 years, we have an 11 year old son. And, um, and he's a, he's a yeah. good dude. Oh, he's, he's incredible. But I do, I do parent and, and navigate my, my, my relationship and my marriage um with my wife based off of those circumstances so at some point i don't know when it was but at some point i i I determined for myself i would never put my my kids um through that same kind of circumstance that that i learned real real early on how easy it was to quit um, how easy it was to turn you know throw in the towel when things got tough and i determined that was not going to be who i was um and so you know, 15 years uh, this coming June, 11 year old, um, amazing uh, baby boy. And um, yeah, it definitely did shape me in, in that way. Did, when you found out that that wasn't quote unquote, I mean, there, there really is, you know, I, I want to let people know that there is no normalcy, right? People are like, Vikram, you're weird. You guys said Vikram doesn't ever shut the fuck up, right? There's a lot of things that people say about you, but that's just you're who you are, right? And I've and I've personally fought trying to be other people. Like at one point I thought, okay, if I'm more like this person, or if I'm more like that person, if I'm more like him or her, people will like me more. And then I realized like, as I was trying to fit into all these different categories personally, I just pushed more people away and I didn't like myself. So not only did people not respond to me well, I didn't respond to myself well. And so when you found out that you weren't quote unquote living the the normal American life with, you know, one or two dads, right. But like four or five at that point and your brother's gone because that's a six, you know, you're 12, he's 18. That's mm-hmm. a big gap. Yeah. What happened in your head? Like what, 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 what did your self-talk start saying? Like, what was the, you know, cause that now you're starting to see other kids. You're starting to go to other people's houses you're playing sports, you're having real like, you know, young adult conversations. And I think you grow up fast when you, when you really, it's like all of a sudden there's a light switch that goes off and you're like, whoa. Yeah. What, when that light switch went off, how did you, how did you cope with it? Like, I mean, cause you, I don't, I don't know that you've ever had drug and alcohol problems. No, no, I, I, I never have. In fact, you know, which is uh, shocking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I guess that would have been a real easy thing to turn to. And, um, you know, I don't know, man, you know, my, 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 my mom, she, 
she loved us to death. And, and I mean, I, I, I put it past and she's still alive and, and still loves us to death. And so she, there was, there was never any question, even though these guys were coming and going, there's never any question who her real priority was. And so I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, I turned out okay. Uh, because, because I, there was never any question in my mind. I, I had that person, I had that North star and that beacon, my mom, even though she chose, you know, uh, these, these wrong fellas, she didn't have a drug and alcohol problem. And I did have a, a healthy, uh, a healthy, um, person that was, a, a instrumental in my life that I could look to for, you know, various areas of, of what healthy living did look like. Um, you know, but yeah, the, you know, what is normal, you know, how do you define normal? And, and right. I, I agree with you. I think that that, that is something that, um, is, is not, you can't really define it. Um, I do think that we have other people that we identify that we, we see that we want to emulate their, their way that they show up for the world, the way that they treat other people, the way that they, they, you know, um, succeed in business and in life. And so we gravitate towards those things because we, we understand that success leaves clues. And when you see enough people um, having the kind of success in their relationships, in their finances, um, with their, with their, you know, um, businesses, those things, um, we, we look to close the, 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 the distance to that we look to get closer in proximity to those kinds of things. And then, and then, you know, look at our own behavior, our own decision making and say, is this the thing that, um, that this whole population of successful people that I want to see myself becoming one day, is this the same way they think that they would respond, that they would um, invest in and those kinds of things. And so I think that's what really kind of helped shape me, um, you know, as far as light bulbs go when, when, um, when I was younger, I don't know that I really had um, light bulb moments that I can really recall. I just know that I didn't want to, I didn't want to subject um, my family to that circumstance. I did find kind of early on that I have a real ability to, um, to just put things in compartments and put them away. And sometimes that's a really, really helpful thing. Sometimes that's a rule. That's a challenge because yeah. sometimes if I'm putting a, a relationship that is otherwise a, um, a relationship that I've had with, with somebody for a long time, uh, and I can just put that in a, in a compartment and, and put it away. That's, that's not always a healthy thing, right? Because then I'm not, I'm not thinking about, um, how they may feel or the honoring the relationship, um, and the time and, and energy that's been put into it over the years. And so I have to be very aware. Self-awareness is really, really key when it comes to that. Wow. Uh, and, and that's just part of my journey, um, and using it as a superpower when it's appropriate and then and then being very self-aware when um, it could be something that hinders uh, me or others uh, in you know in the, the wrong way. You know, I really like that compartmentalizing is good and I and I see a lot of people do that. I see a lot of guys do that especially um, that I know maybe it's because I hang out with people that are somewhat similar to me. we're, we're very driven. Um, we've had some trauma in our life. I think everybody has a, a level of trauma. Some are different. So our coping mechanisms are different, but I think we've all had some level of trauma. Even people that say they've never had anything happen in life. When you start to really unpack it, there's epigenetics, right? That we all have. So we, we actually carry trauma of two to three generations. Even if our parents were like really good, we still carry the trauma through the womb that we didn't even know about because it's just, it's just how we are as we're, we're sponges, right? Our brains are developing, we're sponges. And so we carry that, that energy cord on us. Um, you said something that's interesting to me, which is you can compartmentalize people that you've been in relationships and you, and you sometimes forget about the effort that they put into the relationship, not the effort you put in, but the effort they put in and how it makes them feel. How do you stay present to the moment? You know, um, this is where this is where um, you know making sure that I am intentional about uh, about 
exploring that area. You know, when we moved from Idaho to California, when, when I was given the opportunity to join the Fit Body team, we, we packed up and left, um, you know, our, our friends and family there. And, right. you know, that out of sight, out of mind thing becomes very real very quickly. So it takes a lot of intentionality um, to, to do things like send gratitude text and, you know, thank God for, for things like social media where that the, these people are, are still present and you're reminded and you can engage with them in that way because that that has helped me be able to stay connected to them and carry on the conversation. But then, you know, I owe a tremendous amount of, of um, gratitude to my wife because my wife is much more of that that caring person and she's she counterbalances me in that way to where she it's very natural for her to um, to stay connected and um, and she doesn't put things in compartments the way that I do. And so there's a very healthy balance that exists. And she'll remind me, like she reminds me, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday or so-and-so's this going on. And and, um, and thank God that she does that because um, that allows me to then reach out to them and and uh, and connect with them. So, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's part of the relationship and what she brings to the table. It's also part of like me just staying very aware and, and, um, and conscious about it. Yeah, I think that's part of the feminine energy. You know, I think the connection is more feminine than masculine. Men are, men are, you know, we, we, I could do a podcast with you and I have to actually, like, even though we're recording it on Zoom, so wherever people are watching or listening, I could look off into the star for hours. Like I could literally turn off the video and not look at you once and have an amazing conversation Whereas women, there, there's actually a study where if you put two chairs and you took two boys and you had the chairs facing each other, the boys will actually, and you, like you're on the end of a dock, the boys will turn the chairs out so that they can look into the horizon. And if you take those same two chairs and you have them facing the horizon, you put two little girls there, they're going to face them inward so that they look eye to eye. Oh, interesting. And I was talking to this girl yesterday, I, um, you know, I'm dating. And so I was talking to this girl yesterday and and I was, you know, she lives out of town. So I was being kind of dirty. And, um, and I said, you know, does that excite you? And she goes, and I, I was doing a kind of a mental test because there, there was a whole elaborate conversation that went into this. Sure. Um, but I was asking her some questions and we were on FaceTime and she says, why can't you ever just be present? And I was like, fudge, man. And so I, I, I started saying some things to her and I was like, does that, get you excited. And she's like, not really. And I said, if I said that, but I was staring into your eyes on FaceTime, would that get you excited? She's like, yeah, that would be pretty exciting. That'd be awesome. I said, if I just sat there and stared into your eyes and said nothing out of those three scenarios, what would be, what, what would you like the most? And she said, number three, Hmm. she said, just sitting there, especially knowing how I am just sitting there without any distractions and just looking at me and being present would be the biggest thing you could give me. And mm-hmm. it's, it's that intentionality that you talk about of where your, your wife kind of holds that space for your presence um, so that you can go out and do the gratitudes. And I think it's, um, is it Brendan Burchard's? I, I can't find it, but he's got um, in, in the daily planner, it's who do I need to send a gratitude text to? Could be. I don't, I don't know. I, I know it's a great, it's a great thing. I, I don't know who, who started it well and you know the funny thing is is that i always think about the people who are immediately in my life Mm -hmm. i don't think about the people who are who made me who i am today i I forget about those people and so i I like what you said is that you it makes you're very intentional with your your behaviors and and I think that's important. I think that's important. I think that's who you are as a human being, right? You're, you're, you're very intentional. And I think a lot of it personally, you know, from knowing you now from a, I mean, I, I don't know you as well as I, as I should from spending the amount of time that we did in deep, you know, burial sessions and um, crawling through fun little, you know, pits and things of that nature. But why law enforcement? Well, I think that was a later, you know, as you saw what they did, you said that triggered something in you. Why, why, what triggered? Um, I think from a, from a, like a deep um, kind of emotional standpoint, I think, you know, because I was, I was, I didn't have that protector 
uh, in my life growing up, um, you know, or consistent protector. I think there was probably something inside of me that that called to be that for for others that also didn't have it. And so I think probably on a deep psychological level that that was in play there. Um, uh, but, you know, I I've always been of the, the thought process that, you know, everybody has their version of the American dream and what it is that they want to accomplish in life for themselves and for their families. And it's different for everybody. And um, I also recognize that irregardless of if we want to look at the monster in the room and admit that the monster exists, um, every community has people in it that will um, either seize an opportunity that's presented to them or they will create an opportunity to victimize others. An um, example of this is, is uh, just the other day, you, you, you know, you and I, we share a common hobby uh, and passion for cycling. I love it. And um, and so my son, we have a we have a German Shepherd, and uh, her name is Raka, a three year old German Shepherd, uh, and he took her for a walk at about seven o'clock, um, you know, last week in the evening. And uh, when he came back, he didn't close the garage door. Well, I came uh, into the the garage at about four thirty in the morning to to get ready for my ride, and the bike was gone. <sighs> And so, you know, we have cameras outside the house. We have one in the garage and there was somebody that, that about 3.45 in the morning uh, was in the neighborhood, uh, walks into their garage, looks around, runs over to the bike, takes it and then runs out with it. Oh uh, man. That opportunity was presented to them. That was somebody that was out there looking for opportunities. They were, they were in the neighborhood at 3.45 in the morning looking for an right. opportunity just like that, looking to victimize other people. Now, you know, it's a $7,000 um, bike. Oh, and, um, your bike yeah. is beauty. Yeah. And so, you oh. know, it, um, the, the worst thing for me, really, you, you just feel like this, like this sense of like violation that happens when you, when you feel like somebody else came into your, to your castle in, in, they were within the confines of your space and they took something from you. You just feel so violated. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, the, the silver lining, of the whole thing is we have insurance. We, we sent the insurance, the, the video. Well, I mean, everybody's safe. He could have tried to break into the house. He could have, right. you know, had a weapon and put you guys yeah. at real harm. He took a material item, which, you yeah. know, it sucks, but you're still violated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if he had come in the house, you know, our German shepherd there and we, you know, um, mm -hmm. My, my, my wife and I are both very skilled in a variety of different areas. And so <laughs> I think would have gotten pretty, um, pretty escalated very quickly had that happened. However, right. yeah, it was just property. We have insurance. The insurance um, already put the money in our account and I've got a new bike on the way. Okay, so all good news there. But as it relates to law enforcement, you know, I those people are out there. They're in every community. Yeah. You have people that will go out there and 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 they will victimize others in a variety of ways. And sometimes um, they have these, these criminals, uh, they have no value to life, like the, your property or your money or whatever to them is, is worth doing extreme things over. And, and I wanted to be that person that stood in between the good people that just wanted to live their lives and uh, and achieve whatever level of success and happiness they were after in whatever direction they wanted and and be between them and these these criminals that will victimize. And that's law enforcement. That's what law enforcement does. And that's and that's what they're out there doing every day. Um, and so uh, I, I self-sponsored to the academy in 2001. I was in the academy when 9-11 happened. Um, which was a really interesting time to be getting involved in law enforcement because, you know, we, we saw a lot of first responders perish that day. Um, and, uh, but finished that, continued my, my degree in psychology, and then was hired on by um, the Ada County Sheriff's Office in 2006. Uh, and that's where I started my over 10 years in, in law enforcement. You know, um, first off, thank you for putting your life at risk every day because during, during your service, because I, I, you know, people give, we see things in the media and what I see is different. I, I see people that are my friends 
I see people that were my friend's parents, you know, I've been pulled over, I've been handcuffed, I've been thrown in the back of a jail car of a police, not thrown, but, you know, put in the back of a police car. Um, I've also been helped by officers of the law. Um, I had somebody pull me over back when I had my, you know, that's actually the, the car on the wall. He pulled me over. He's like, dude, that's a really awesome car. Like, if you're not in a rush, can we talk about it? I'm like, I'm literally as high as a cloud right now. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say no to you. <laughs> um, we smoked a lot of weed growing up and, um, and, and I've just had great conversations, you know, growing up in Bakersfield, we, we have a lot of access to, you know, there's not a lot of like bougie places. And so everybody just kind of hangs out at the same places. And what I see is people that want to make the play, the world better. Now, are there corrupt people out there? Yeah, there's corrupt people everywhere in this world, but for the most part, a lot of the people that I've known in law enforcement had something happen to them at a young age. They, they had an abusive parent. They had a upbringing where there was somebody that was not all of them. I, I don't know a lot of them, but the people I've talked to in the past, they, there was a reason why they took that path. And it wasn't just like, it was the only place that I could get a job because it's not necessarily the easiest place to get work at. You know, you got to go through the academy, you got to pass some tests. And then it's not like being a firefighter, which everybody love and girls are like, oh my God, you're a fire. It's like, you're a yeah. cop. Oh my God, run the other way. Yeah. You know, so it, it's not a job that's got a lot of glory outside of a few big events. And mm -hmm. so to become a protector and, and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the last thing I would want to do is pull over and walk up to a car in the middle of the night in a bad neighborhood with the windows all blacked out, taillights popped out, and then you scan the license and you're like, oh, this person's done a bunch of bad things or the, the owner of the car. And you don't know what you're walking into. Yeah. Like, I, I, there's no part of me that wants that in my life. Like, I want to sleep in my bed. I want to have the AC on. One day I'll have a beautiful woman to cuddle until then I got my fucking three pillows. Like, I don't want to go into a situation that's going to put me in harm's way. Whereas you chose to do that and you did it for a long time and you did it in very scary situations where people are shooting at each other and shooting at you. And there's guns involved a lot because you, you, you know, of what you chose to do, what, like, what makes a human being want to do that? I mean, I know you said you, you, you were a protector, but what makes you want to be like that? Cause I think you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate you, but I think you're absolutely nuts. Perhaps I am, you know, I, 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 I really, um, I don't know what it is about, about it, but I just, I absolutely loved it. And the ones that, that I, I worked with, um, that continue to, to go out and serve every day, they love it too. There's, it is a scary profession. It is a thankless profession, you know, especially today, I think probably more than ever, you Sad. know, with this whole defund police thing is it's, Sad. it's, um, it's really unfortunate that, you know, you have this, this, um, police officer in Minneapolis who is, is absolutely deserves to go to prison for, for what he did for kneeling on a guy's neck. Um, I don't care if the person was black, white, Asian, purple, green, it doesn't matter. You, you, right. that, that police officer, from what I understand and from what I know, um, murdered a guy and that, and you, yep. you got it, you got to go to prison. You got to, I think the, the, the court should throw the, the, um, the book at him and you know, yep. he should spend his the remaining days locked up, uh, in a cage, but, um, I don't know anybody who thinks any differently than that, but unfortunately the, no. the, you know, social media and, you know, mainstream media and stuff there because of angles and because of agendas and things, um, for whatever reason, people, it, it feels like they, they all of a sudden have this major distrust of, in law enforcement. And there's this massive knee jerk reaction to, to start, uh, you know, calling for the resignations of, you know, various law enforcement um, executives and, and chiefs and sheriffs, you have the massive defunding. Um, and, and, and it just, it, I just don't understand it. I, I, my heart bleeds for um, those that are uh, in the profession right now that are, that are dealing with it. I, I know, and we all know that the, the silent majority 
are, are people who support, just like what you're describing. There are people who actually support. There's far more people out there who, who support law enforcement than there are people calling for uh, either resignations or defunding. However, the ones that are, are, are extremely loud. And you have high ranking politicians, you have, you know, you have community leaders, and of course you have the, the power of, of uh, social media and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram that are, that are pushing these agendas and right. the algorithms that are putting in front of millions and millions of people that are shifting the way people think about the profession, all because of a, a um, fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the people out there that wear the uniform that have no business wearing uniform. Yeah. But the overwhelming majority, the 99.99999% of, of the those that wear the uniform all feel the way that that the rest of society does about about that misbehavior um, and and the corruption and, and whatever went into it. So um, you know, I I loved it. I loved being involved in it for whatever reason. I love the 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 chaos of it all. That's what drove me <laughs> to really kind of join the SWAT team. And and you know, I think for me it was just this understanding that that when really bad things are happening and good people need help. Like I want to be there to, to help them. I wanna be one of those that can help shift and change the circumstance um, to, to, to help good people um, you know, remove themselves from it and, and address the, the bad people that are causing it to happen. I just, it, I, I always enjoyed it. My wife hated it. Um, oftentimes she would learn what I was doing and where I was and what was going on uh, from the from the news, she would she would see me and the team on the news, and and um, she wouldn't be hearing from me because obviously I'm not on the phone, um, and so she didn't like that for for obvious and, and justified reasons. But right. um, I yeah, it was just kind of a natural thing for me. I really enjoyed. Well, I, I like how you said you enjoyed the chaos because I want to you know as as much as I we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I, I think the next progression is you learned a lot about chaos. You learned a lot about making quick decisions. You learned a lot about having small fragments of information and having to make very important life-threatening situational decisions. And you had to do it on the fly, right? And I know that in the project, you, you taught us some framework and you showed us some examples of how quick it is to be deceived and how quick it is to just milliseconds of information can be the difference between life and death, which I was, I, I still think about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like literally that's how business is, mm -hmm. right? And the, the, the people that follow this, this, this program, right? They want to know how these situations can help with their business. They want to know how these situations can help in life. Because when do you ever have like all the information possible. Like, when do you ever have, even if with, with your own family or your wife, you know, you guys get into an argument over something, you forgot to pick up the milk or you didn't pick up your clothes or you forgot to take the trash out. Arguments are never really about big things. They're always about like little stupid things that you just forget to do. But then that leads into something else and that leads into something else. And the next thing you know, it, it's a heated environment. And like in business, you know, you've owned your own business you are running a very large business now. And the last 12 months of your guys's life in this current business that you're in have been very chaotic. Mm -hmm. You guys have regulations, you have your, your franchises are having challenges. There's a lot of change happening every moment of the day. How does your experience like relate some of that into the, the modern world where we're living today. So tell me how your past has helped shape your present. And then how can, it's kind of a long three-part question, but then also how can people take small fragments of information and make decisions that are going to have impact on people's lives, maybe not physically, but financially or emotionally, because if the business shuts down, you have to lay off five or 10 or a hundred or a thousand employees. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as, you know, my background goes, um, the SWAT team is really what taught me for the, for the first time, um, the, the magnitude of, you know, leadership and communication, uh, decentralized command, um, you know, 
thinking about the the, the person to your right and the left um, rather than just yourself and a whole host of, of things that make a special operations team so successful. If you if you think about uh, you know the, the the kinds of things that special operations are tasked with doing, um, it does. It requires it requires the, the entire team to be operating at its at its peak. Um, and to be executing on its individual task with the common um, thread of we, we succeed and fail as a team. And so that obviously carries over um, you know, in every way into business. And so as it relates to how I, how I lead the team at Fitbody and, and you know, ran my own business uh, for five years and on those various pieces, um, you know, I, it, it just, it, it just all goes into um, the same bucket, right? I mean, in business, if there's a breakdown of communication, if there's a lack of clarity, if there are assumptions being made, those assumptions will be backfilled with, with um, whatever thought that a, a particular person would, would have. If, if there's not a clarity around what, what is the, what is the objective that we are after? What does the win look like? And um, and if I'm trying to run everything and I'm trying to be the person like the puppet master and, and not trusting my team, well, then I'm going to be the bottleneck of it. So decentralized command is, is me understanding very clearly through, you know, Bedros, uh, as the CEO, what it is that he, he wants to have executed from the standpoint of what does one year from now look like, um, I can go to the team and make sure sure that the team, I have the right people on the bus, on the right seat, and, um, and then make sure they have what they need to be successful, make sure they have the tools that they need. Um, and I just apply all of those leadership and communication and, 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 um, and attributes from the SWAT team into the team at uh, FitBody and, you know, and we've we've been able to really do pretty well through COVID. I mean, all things considered, um, uh, we've been able to weather the storm um, pretty well, and it's because of the strength of the team that we have here at headquarters, which then trickles down to the support and the assets and the resources um, that that is distributed to all of our franchisees. Um, so, with you know, because of my unique experience with with understanding the precision. And the focus and the execution of special operations, with also being my own, you know, an entrepreneur where I started my own brick and mortar, uh, grew that business to a place um, in five years. I was able to take a successful um, exit from it, and and now can um, can work with teams that work with other entrepreneurs. You know, I, I love working with entrepreneurs. I love working with people who are hungry to go out and and change the world and. Um, and provide a service or, or a product to people that, um, that will make other people's lives better and enhance and enrich other people's lives. And I love working with those entrepreneurs who, who, who will default the action. They will, all they just need is they need proximity to others who, who are where they want to be. And, um, and so, you know, I've got a great team uh, who, who, who execute um we have a great relationship and that that trickles down to uh all of the franchisees and i think that's critical amongst entrepreneurs you're, you're muted bud was, sorry about that i was coughing earlier um i remember the story that you told about during was it the project or was it at the mastermind where you talked about how you you're you, you could be number one when you clear a house so you could be the leader and then as you go into a room, the number three guy goes into the next room. So he becomes the leader of his squad. And then the number seven guy goes into a different room. And so you're always rotating between the front, the back, the side. So sometimes you're the back, sometimes you're the center. And I think that's what you were talking about here earlier um, when you were talking about the, you know, Bedros, who's the CEO of Fitbody Bootcamp currently, and then everybody else on your team who are in their current positions. And maybe one day you're going to swap into a new role or somebody on your team's going to swap into a new role, or maybe just somebody calls in sick for the day, right? I mean, we are in a world where people are getting sick and not able to work. Um, you know, COVID, I, I'm not too concerned about dying of COVID, but I don't want to get sick from COVID, right? I don't want to be on 
flu watch for three weeks. Um, yeah, my whole family just recovered from COVID and my little brother was out for five days, you know? And so I, I, I'm the type of guy that if I'm healthy, I'm running, I had a hundred miles, but when I go down, I'm like, mom, just baby me, right? So I don't want to get sick ever, which is why I think we all share that common passion for our health. It's one of our, one of our pillars in life. But, you know, when you talk about the decentralized command and the decentralized control, a lot of entrepreneurs that I work with and a lot of entrepreneurs that I know want to be in everything. They want to control it all. They want to, and they are the bucket. They are the bottleneck. They are the person that is just holding up everything because they don't trust the people that they've brought on or they haven't created the systems and the training, right? So I heard something about leadership yesterday and what the D in leadership stands for is development, right? So you got to listen, you got to assess, you got to L-E-A, you got to, uh, well, what's the A? The A is like you give advice, and then the D is you develop, right? So most people, they, they listen to a little bit and then they advise and then they just bounce. And you didn't really give anybody like the development. So how do you develop people? Because I know that was part of your role. Um, how do you develop people in an organization? Like, how do you develop? Because, you know, a lot of businesses, fail, first off, forget, leave alone, have a successful exit. Most businesses fail. Um, how did you, how do you develop your people so that you can trust them in the trenches? So I think the first thing is really to, to have a, an abundance mindset over a scarcity mindset. I think that in, in too many cases, there's this, this thought process that if I develop my team um, uh, or somebody on the team too well, they may leapfrog over me on, you know, the chain of command, or they may be given opportunities themselves that I would want. And so I need to restrict their, their growth because I don't want to, I don't want to get passed up on opportunity based on, on their development. And I think that's a massively um, disruptive scarcity mindset approach. And, and you do see it from time to time. And, and, and you know, what I would encourage, um, every person who leads a team. And first of all, in order to be a leader, you have to be able to make decisions, make decisions for yourself and leaders make decisions for other people. And so right. if, if you're going to be making decisions for other people, you have to have an abundance mindset and to recognize that the, the entire, nobody ever experiences uh, real success and, and achieves real greatness by themselves. And so, um, you know, to, to pour into the people and support the people and give them the empowerment that they need to do their jobs well and to really excel and to really get into the spotlight of the rest of the leadership team. Um, that, that I think that's reflective of the, the, the leader. So if I have somebody on my team that consistently is getting accolades, is consistently being, uh, you know, seen in a, in a positive light for their contributions and um, is being considered for more opportunity that that brings me a tremendous amount of, of pride because I know that it's it's the way in which I'm facilitating that development, the, the decisions that I'm making, um, the, the things that I am providing to them that that's allowing them to be successful. And when right. when they are allowed to be successful, that's when there's more opportunity to um, to elevate, there's more money that can be made. There's more impact that can be had, and um, there's there's if we have that going on amongst the entire team, the entire team will elevate, and it, and you know opportunity is offered up to to everybody. Um, That's a great mindset, dude. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that is <laughs> that's so spot on. Is that in organizations people all you know, managers, I, I've heard it so many times when I hired, why are you leaving your organization? And they're like, well, we don't want to bad mouth our, our person, but we're just, there's no more growth. Why not? Our manager won't give us the tools and the openness. They won't give us the reviews we need because they're threatened that if we take their job, they're out of a job right? because they've stopped developing themselves. Cause they know that when they go home, they sit down with a can of beer and you go home and you sit down with a book. 
Mm -hmm. right? So they know that the other person is on a development path that they might not be on or whatever it is, they're threatened because this person's coming in and somebody's, oh, wow, that's a really great employee. But what they don't see is that I look to you and you look to them. And so everybody gets moved up along the ranks because if you develop the person beneath me, even though they have that innate ability to do it, if you recognize the talent, you develop the talent, then they're going to want you to develop more people. Yeah. But people are so short-sighted. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and those, it's the ones that are short-sighted and do have a scarcity mindset. It's because of that, that they get leapfrogged. It's because it's because CEOs and, and, uh, executive teams, they, they, there's no, there's no place within a, within a leadership team and a leadership role for somebody who's got a scarcity mindset, uh, somebody who, who is a poor communicator, somebody who is out for their own interests, somebody who essentially is, you know, John Maxwell says there is a difference between positional authority and moral authority. Right. Somebody who has positional authority, who has got a title or a rank. So they walk around telling other people what to do. And those other people will do it because they respect the rank, but they don't respect the person. That's a problem. And you, instead, moral authority is somebody who will do what the person says because they respect the person. They don't miss deadlines because they don't want to disappoint the person. They, they will make more money uh, and, and to, based on their contributions, we can, we can tie more revenue directly to that because they understand that the importance of being an entrepreneur and their role in helping the company as a whole grow, um, they will do that because they respect the leader and they won't call in sick. They won't, you know, they won't, you know, goof off while, while the, the department leads or the, you know, the leadership teams away. They just stay focused and they drive because they believe that if they do that, um, the leader will elevate them. The leader will go to the rest of the executive team and call out those contributions and give them the accolades and will be truly, um, you know, proud of them to where, you know, we hope that they elevate up. Um, and we hope that we can put them in a, in a, in a position of more responsibility because we work for a for-profit company and, you know, I don't know how I've never worked in a nonprofit. I don't know how that works, but I know in the, in the, well, in they're the all profit too, dude. I mean, every yeah. company's got a bottom line and everybody's got a top line and for-profit for or nonprofit. I don't know why they call it a nonprofit because it's all about profit, right? It's yeah. all about revenue generation. Cause the more money you bring in, the more good you can do with it. Sure. So, yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be completely applicable. I know for-profit companies, I know that we are in the business of making money, but it's not just revenue. Like we, it doesn't matter about how much revenue we, we bring in. It's about how much profit is there at the, at the end of the day when all the expenses are paid and the costs uh, are, are, are divvied out. So, um, you know, that's, that's the way I approach it. And it's been massively, um, it's been massively um, uh, beneficial to, to the organization as a whole and the team. And I do really um, you know, contribute a lot of my success to the special operations piece of it. I think being able to stay calm in combat, which is what we learn, you know, um, to be able to make decisions under stress, to be able to see around corners and, and consider, you know, the multiple layers and, and reverse engineer things and, um, and, and be able to, to learn how to execute as an individual and as a team. Um, I, um, I contribute a lot of my success to that, but, you know, not everybody comes from special operations right. backgrounds. And so, you know, for, for, for everybody else, it's a matter of, you know, when you talk about some people go home and they watch a, you know, they binge watch on Netflix while others, they really pour into their personal and professional development. Um, it's identifying who are those other people that are, that are, that are experiencing and, and having the kind of success in whatever area they want and, and be closer to those people, you know, um, you know, cl close that gap between yourself and those people, attend the conferences, hire them as coaches, you know, see them as mentors, um, you know, just re read their books, you know, contribute on online, like, like close that gap to those people and, and, and carve out and cut away the people that are not helpful to where you want to see yourself. Um, we say trim the fat, right? Get, you know, get rid of those toxic behaviors, those, those toxic relationships, those vices, and replace it with, with the, the healthy stuff. 
and good things happen. Yeah, dude, there's so much, there's so much knowledge in there. Um, I, you know, I'm a big fan, obviously, of the project. I'm such a fan of it. I did it twice. First time I, first time I quit, but uh, I was such a big fan of it that I decided to come back and suffer with you guys some more. I, I really want more people because, I, you know, what I've started to realize the more that I'm on like Clubhouse and the more that I talk to people, I started realizing that it's not just men that want men to be better, but it's also women who want men to be better. Yeah. And I think there's a huge responsibility. And as you guys shared, so, you know, after the project was over and you graduate, you get to, you get to know some of these guys on a more personal level, but you guys share that a lot of the time, the people that are pushing the men to show up are the women. Yeah. And, and I was like, damn, I wouldn't even have thought because I'm single. So I would, I, it doesn't even register, mm -hmm. but Tell me a little bit about how you, you're very heart centered. You're very, I feel like you're very spiritual. Um, you have a very, maybe not spiritual, but you have a faith based in you. Tell me about how you got into the project. I know you got, we got a few more minutes left, but tell me how you got into the project and why you continue to do it because you guys put in a lot of effort. You guys spend a lot of hours and then you guys are up with us for you know the 75 hours plus the before plus the after so i mean you know it's four days where you're completely gone from your family and you're doing these things six seven times a year so i mean yeah. that's a full month that you don't get to really spend time with your 11 year old and your your wife mm -hmm. why why invest that energy back into into other humans at that level Well, I think it's really important that um, everybody finds something that truly fulfills them. I think that, um, you know, there are too many people out there who are just kind of floating through life. They don't really have anything that fulfills them. They're not really feeling like they, they, they are, are serving others. Um, they're not having much impact on the world. Um, and I think that's a tragedy because, you know, life is short and there is so much joy and fulfillment that comes from helping other people that it shows up the benefits of it show up in in um in life in our own personal lives in so many other ways in and in our relationships so um you know as it relates to the project first of all you know it's for men only um the project is, is a men's personal development program we get asked about the female version of it all the time but you know as you as you know well um you know the the the, the things that the experiences that are shared and uh, particularly when it comes to the hunt destroy, which is the negative cognitions thing, we, we talk about the things that we understand as men. We understand that the, the, you know, um, the, the vibe that's out there about toxic masculinity. You know, we understand the, the role that, that in, in, in most cases within, within most households, the structure in which the, the, the wife looks to the husband to be the one that, that provides in, uh, in a variety of ways and to be the protector and to be the head of the household and um, that nature versus nurture thing. And, and you know, it, it goes back, you know, millions of years that, that it's the male that's gone out in, and done the hunting, done the killing, brought back the, the meat, um, you know, Developed the sons when the when the sons went from the the mother son to the father son and there was a rite of passage that happened to 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 create and, and develop the next generation of hunters to provide for the family and it was the the mothers that would stay in the cave and stay in the hut and you know they would they would do all the nurturing piece of it and it's a it's a, an essential reason why our species has has developed and continues to to thrive today but it that's that's been a missing thing for far too long is this rite of passage right. is this 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 um, spewing of of you know negativity towards the the male masculinity and uh, and we see the effects of it you know all throughout um and you know hitler i think was the one that said it best when he talked about like hey if we want to if we want to change the world we just have to we have to focus on one generation if we can change one generation we can change the, the 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 dynamic and the paradigm of the world through one generation, and 
So we are hyper focused on helping men become better leaders uh, of themselves. You have to be able to lead yourself before you can lead anybody else. It's a it's a it's a farce that somebody can lead other people, their families, their their businesses, or anybody else if they are not themselves being led by themselves first. Right. Uh, and then um, we want to make them uh, provide more for the family, more opportunity. There's there's a, a, a scarcity mindset a lot of times with money, and people have this weird relationship with money, uh, where where people say money doesn't buy you happiness. Money doesn't, you can't go exchange any kind of currency and, and, and pull happiness out of a vending machine. That's, that's not what that's about. Money provides opportunity and money is a vehicle to be able to do things that make you tremendously happy. And that could be, yep. I, want to, I want to write a check right now for $25,000 to this charity because that charity is doing great things for the world and it fires me up and I want to be able to, 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 to donate the kind of money that's going to be meaningful to them. Right. It could be, I want to load up with, with 25 of my closest friends and family members and go on a seven day cruise, all expenses paid for everybody and just go have an experience that otherwise the rest of them couldn't be able to afford. Right. Uh, you know, money is the vehicle to be able to provide opportunities that, that generate this extreme sense of happiness and fulfillment. And so the project is, is meant to realign and refocus on there's no shortage of money out there. Money is being exchanged at, at, at a tremendous rate every single day. And it's just a matter of, of going out and doing the kind of things that other people are willing to give you their money for. Um, and so the project is really just designed to make these guys, you know, better husbands, better fathers, better providers, um, you know, more con con contributors to their, their community and, um, and live a life of fulfillment. Um, and that's, you know, would we really hope that one day there's a female version. We really hope that there's a, a version where um, women who understand women and understand the complexities of, of being a woman and a mother and a, and a nurturer and, um, and uh, you know, raising a family and giving birth, that they they develop uh, their own version of the project to help women level up in, in that way. Um, but that's why I do the the project. That's why I spend the time developing because the more men we have out there doing it, um, the better off our our world is with 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 men living a life of purpose, um, leading themselves appropriately, leading their families appropriately. Um, having, you know, strength in their finances, strength in their relationships, um, and just, uh, you know, being purpose-driven overall. Yeah, no, I mean, I, a lot of people are like, oh, why, why can't women do it? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of groups for women. Like, women and sisterhood is, like, abundant. Um, I cut my video off because our, our connection was lagging a little bit. Um, but the, the men groups are, are, are what we need more of and the brotherhood and the being able to call somebody and be like, yo, this is what I'm dealing with right now. This is what I'm facing right now. These are the challenges. And then having people that have been through something before to support you and realizing that it does take a tribe and it does take that rite of passage to actually drop into your true masculine. I, the reason why I think we have a lot of toxic masculinity you know, whatever that term truly means to everybody, it's different, but is because we, we never went through hard stuff as, as people growing up. And that's what the project provides. It provides a safe environment for people to do extraordinarily hard things while being taught why they're doing it and the benefit and the value of it. Right. And so it's a, it's a really, like I said, it's such a great place. I, I decided to do it twice. I mean, God, what an overachiever. <laughs> I highly recommend you you guys just do it once. Um, but you know, if you really want to do it twice, just ring the bell at like hour 50 and um, they'll they'll welcome you back with open arms. That's right. Um, That's Matt, how do people find you? Uh, best place is on Instagram. So Matt Schneider underscore official. Um, I'm sure you'll probably put the spelling on there, but Matt Schneider underscore official um, is the best place to find me on Instagram. It's got links to the different things. I um, would love to hear from, from anybody who's interested in knowing more. Um, you know, I, I, I love connecting with other people who, who are driven to dominate, um, people who are, are looking to level up. Uh, you know, I, I, love, I love putting myself in closer proximity to others who are, who are 
looking to change the world and provide impact. And I love pouring into to those who, who are where I was at one point and are looking to be where I am now. Um, I invest my time and energy into the people who were once where I am and are, are now where I want to be. And I, and I think if we just we continue to, to close those gaps, um, the better off the world will be. And so connect with me there, send me a DM. Um, let's start a conversation if there's anything that I could ever do um, to, you know, to help and connect, I would, I would love the opportunity. And if you guys are in the Southern California area, he definitely is an avid cyclist. So bring your bike and, uh, and go, go get some miles together. Cause, uh, he, he definitely, I, I watch your Strava and yeah. I'm like, man, this dude's putting in some work. Um, <laughs> you guys, Matt's a truly, he's a, he's a genuine human being. He's a great entrepreneur. He's a great father. He's a great husband. He's a great man. Um, if you guys have, honestly, he, he's the type of guy that if you reach out to him, he's actually going to respond to a lot of people in social media say, Oh, reach out to me and I'll get back to you. And, and then you send him a message and you never hear anything back. And it's like, just don't say you're going to get back to me. Like just, just say, follow me on Instagram. Cause I don't really give a shit about talking to you. Yeah. Um, unless you can do something for me. I, I truly don't feel like that's how you are. I, I um, and so you guys, if you're interested in learning more about Matt, just go follow him on Instagram. Uh, and if you want to know more about the project, you know, he, he'd be happy to help you with that too. But otherwise, my friend, thank you so much for your time today. I know we went a little bit over, but um, I really appreciate all the insight and your perspective on the world and you sharing a little bit about your childhood. And um, we will, we will get this out to the world so that they can, they can see how much of a badass you are. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for having me. Do you appreciate it? All right, brother. Talk to you later. Yeah.